I'm Ariel Bowser. I'm mayor of Washington, D.C., and I'm calling to order. I'm calling to order this meeting of the New Columbia Statehood Commission. I would like to recognize the presence of a quorum uh, with all of our members present, and we're waiting on one, uh, except one, who, were, who will be here shortly. Uh, I, as a co-chair, I may convene the meeting, and I am doing so with Senator Strauss, with Senator Brown, and with Representative Garcia. I would like to ask the members to uh, take a look at the minutes circulated from the last meeting. Are there any questions, comments, or corrections on those minutes? Hearing none, I will entertain a motion to approve. It's been moved and seconded. All in favor of the minutes as presented say aye. Aye. Any opposed? The ayes have it. And the minutes are approved. I would like to ask the members to look at the agenda before you. Item one, approval of the minutes. Item two, uh, thank and recognize the members of the Legal Advisory Committee. Item three, the public comment period. Item four, the New Columbia Statehood Commission and a vote on the is a voting item for the public release of the draft, draft constitution. Are there any changes to the agenda as presented? Without objection, I would like to add an item five, which would allow for questions on the draft constitution. Any, any opposition? Uh, let me add a, a item number five, questions. So let me also recognize, in our last meeting, we talked about the working groups uh, that would support the state, uh, the New Columbia State Commission. And I explained then uh, just what the New Columbia State Commission is. Uh, it is the commission that was created by legislation by our co-chair and council chairman, Phil Mendelson. It is made up of the mayor, the council chairman, and, the, and our two senators and representatives. Uh, the Statehood Commission is tasked with promoting statehood for Washington. Sir. The Statehood Commission approved uh, a plan uh, two meetings ago uh, for how we can have a new legislative proposal to go to the council, which would put the question of statehood on the November ballot. Uh, part of that plan uh, was that a legal advisory committee would advise this commission. And that legal advisory committee was also tasked uh, with drafting uh, the Constitution that would be put before this commission and ultimately the uh, next the council and ultimately the voters of the District of Columbia. Uh, some of the members could not be here today, uh, but I will recognize them at the end. Uh, so let me start with John Booker from uh, Eric Fox. Where's John? Give him a big round of applause. Spencer Overton, a professor from Georgetown University. Richard Shore, a partner at Gilbert. Excuse me, George, the George Washington University is where Spencer hails from. And Shelly Broderick, the dean at the University of the District of Columbia Law School. And Council Member Mary Che from the George Washington <laughs> University. <laughs> May I also recognize uh, Professor Viet Den, who couldn't be here from Georgetown, Fred Cook um, from Reuben Winston, Derrick Harris, and Cook, and um, Gary Thompson uh, from Reed Smith, and Michael McGinley, the council from, uh, uh, he's from Bancroft. So give them a round of applause as well. <laughs> I would also like to recognize uh, members of uh, our collective staffs who have been uh, supporting the Legal Advisory Committee as well. And let me start with my staff, Beverly Perry, my senior advisor. 
Brian Moore, the Chief of Staff to Chairman Mendelson. Give him a round of applause. There he is. There he is. And Betsy Cavendish, my general counsel. And Nicholas Nartowitz, he's a Capitol Silly Fellow in Beverly Perry's office. Give him a round of applause. And also Rima. Say that for me. Where's Rima? Give her a big round. There's Rima. So again, I wanted to thank everybody for all of the, the hours that they put in. Uh, we acknowledged at our last meeting the very necessary uh, aggressive schedule that we have, but we also recognize that we want it to be a thoroughly, a thorough aggressive uh, exercise. And that's where we stand now, and we are pleased to be able to discuss what we've come up with. Let me now turn to the members for uh, opening statement, and then um, I think without objection, I'm going to turn to the Legal Advisory Committee <laughs> Um, to make a presentation on the draft constitution, and then we'll have our public comment period focused on questions uh, for the new Columbia State, for, for the advisory committee. Any objection to that order change? Okay. Mr. Chairman? Uh, I'm actually going to pass on an opening statement to uh, my colleagues. Mr. Senator. Thank you, Madam Mayor. This is an exciting day for all of us here in the District of Columbia soon to be the 51st state. Uh, I, I am so excited that I am literally getting chills uh, as we sit here now. Um, let me just begin by thanking the members of the Legal Advisory Committee for their hard work in preparing this draft uh, as the only lawyer, I believe, on the commission, and I'm not sure that's a, an honor necessarily, but um, I was privileged to attend some of those meetings, uh, and while I take no pride of authorship on the document that they're presenting, I take great pride in the quality and skill that those attorneys who have donated their time and wisdom and skill and effort into bringing forth to us this draft today. It is, of course, just an opening draft, uh, it is a starting point that will engage the members of the public, uh, but it is exciting to be participating in the very first, what I believe to be the very first constitutional convention here in the 21st century. And while our founding fathers had to work with quill pens, and in 1982, the state of the art still consisted largely of typewriters, I am excited that we will be taking advantage of all of the modern technology to engage the public in a way that has never been before possible. So I look forward to this effort, and I believe we would be uh, remiss if we did not, uh, at this moment, uh, recognize those from the original 1982 convention that are here. I saw some of them here today, and I would ask at this point, any member of the original 1982 Constitutional Convention that's here uh, with us to please stand and be recognized. We seek only to build on the fine work that you've started, and we appreciate all you have done as the founding parents of our new 51st state. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Thank you. Senator Brown? Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, first, let me um, thank Karen Zolgit and Rachel Bernard, who are on our staff and work for very little money and work tirelessly for this cause. Um, they're a part of the whole project, and they've done a great job, and I think they should be recognized. And let me also say, since the mayor started this process, we've been getting feedback from people. And I know this is a big thing. Uh, the Constitution itself is a big thing. And we're going to have to look at it carefully and decide uh, what makes the most sense for the District of Columbia. But let's not forget what's at stake here. Uh, since I've started in this position, 
our movement has been like the Tower of Babel. Uh, some people want autonomy. Some people want a vote. Some people want retrocession. This is our opportunity to speak with one clear, loud voice that statehood is what makes the people of the District of Columbia whole. Statehood, <laughs> statehood is the remedy. You know, it never ceases to amaze me as I travel around the district that you can go over to the Jefferson Memorial and see we hold these truths to be self-evident that all are created equal, or go over to the Supreme Court and see equal justice under law, or go to visit President Lincoln and see conceived in liberty and dedicated the proposition that all are created equal, because equality is a prerequisite of democracy. And it's time that we end this foolish 215-year anachronism. And imagine what it will be like if we can march up to Capitol Hill with 90 percent, 80 or 90 percent of the people of the District of Columbia uh, in favor of statehood, speaking loudly with a single voice. So that's what we have to focus on. We have to make sure that happens. We have to make sure the city council stands with us. We have to make sure that the city funds this effort properly, and we have to make sure that everybody in this room is involved, because this is really a great opportunity that's been handed to us. Thank you. Representative Garcia. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, this is an exciting time. I'm, I'm actually uh, very pleased to see such a large turnout. That uh, gives me a lot of hope that uh, we're working something or going in the right direction uh, anyhow. I'm also excited to see that uh, Council Members uh, Orange and uh, Anita Bonds have joined us. Uh, we actually talked about this uh, last night at our meeting. So uh, it's statehood everywhere. This is very, very exciting. I want to recognize also uh, Nate Bennett Fleming, who uh, was uh, the former U.S. Shadow Representative. So very excited. To, uh, very uh, pleased that I'm able to be at the table uh, bringing a, a perspective uh, and uh, very excited about the entire process. Thank you. Thank you, Representative. So, um, we're at Lincoln's Cottage, and we all know what happened here. This is where President Lincoln wrote the Emancipation Proclamation. Uh, we chose this site, obviously, because of the significance of a Lincoln being here and writing the document that freed people across the United States. But it is also a fitting reminder that we're not fully free. We don't have full, full democracy in the District of Columbia. So we thought this would be the perfect setting uh, to talk about uh, our, our draft constitution. So let me uh, turn to uh, Ms. Perry, and if she's going to be assisted by any other members of the Legal Advisory Committee, uh, just to walk through the document, I'm going to ask the, the committee for a vote to release it, and then we will release it. And then we'll take uh, some time for, for questions. Thank you, Madam Co-Chair. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Is it on? I don't know. Hello? Hello. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, let me just first of all uh, thank the legal team. Uh, this has been a very quick process. We started this process at the beginning of April, so uh, we've done a lot of work in a few days. And one of the lawyers that uh, it's been a part of this process is also Richard Shore from the firm, law firm of Gibbards that is also here. Um, what you will receive today is a booklet like I'm holding in my hand. This booklet has three parts. It has, the first part is the historic perspective. It explains what is in the Constitution and what is out. Uh, it takes us back, takes us through the 1980s process. Uh, the second part is the rules of public engagement, which the uh, commission voted on last time. And you heard those rules, but uh, in summary, those are seven rules um, that provide for the stability. Uh, it, the rules of engagement, uh, of public engagement, says what the public process will be. Uh, we want to make sure that every single person feels 
feels that they are a part of this process. And that, um, just so you know, because of we are trying to um, meet a clock to have this on the November ballot, we didn't have time for election of delegates. So every single resident of the District of Columbia is in fact a delegate to the Constitutional Convention. <laughs> delegates get the vote. <laughs> Every single person. So, um, and then uh, and the third thing that's in here is the draft constitution. It is a discussion draft that this legal team has come up with. And let me just very quickly tell you what's in the constitution. It is very traditional. It is, uh, it, it starts with a preamble, of course, and a Bill of Rights. The Bill of Rights is the exact same Bill of Rights that was in the, I believe, that was in the 87, and I believe the same one was in the 82. So it is the 87 Bill of Rights that we have added to this Constitution. Uh, it has eight articles. The first article, of course, is the legislative branch. Uh, the second one is the executive branch. The third and the executive branch includes for an elected attorney general, and it also accommodates the provisions for CFO. Uh, the third is the judiciary. The fourth is budget and finance. The fifth is borrowing. Uh, the sixth is uh, referendum and recall procedures. The seventh is amending the, co the uh, Constitution, procedures for amending. And the eighth is to transfer uh, powers from the, go type, the government we have now to a state government. Um, those are the provisions of the Constitution. Uh, you will receive this as soon as the Commission have an opportunity to vote. We have copies here for you. Thank you. Co-Chair, I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Perry and the Legal Committee for their work, and if there's no further debate or discussion, I would move for consideration a motion to release the Constitution of the State of New Columbia. Second. Uh, so there's a motion on the table to release uh, the, the document, including a discussion of the history of uh, constitutions in D.C., the public engagement process, and a discussion draft Constitution. Is there a discussion? Discussion? Yes. Discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? The ayes have it and it's unanimous. So we are now releasing the draft constitution for review and consideration. So who's passing them out? <laughs>
Yes, uh, my name is Dr. Randy Stewart. I'm with the Statehood Green Party as a write-in candidate for City Council at Large. And my question was about uh, what kind of resources will be allocated for the public to be aware of this regarding the vote? How will that be done through commercial television, public, radio, so people will know? Because if we don't get the numbers, this goes down in flames. Well, what we're, we're focused on, this process gets us to getting it on the ballot. And then we will look, we have outlined the committee, uh, is one of the committees that's about grassroots advocacy as well as nationwide advocacy. And we're calling on all of our state put partners to help us with the part once we get it on the ballot through the council um, up into the vote. If I, if I could add to that, uh, the commission has a budget, so we do have the ability to pay for outreach, and in addition, uh, this will be on the November ballot, and the November ballot is a presidential election year, so we expect there will be a very high turnout. Okay. Question in the back. Hello, I'm Julie Cazella, Chair of the Historical Society of Washington. Mayor Bowser, you were asked an excellent question on Kojo today. Why the name New Columbia? Fifteen states have the names from rivers that run through them or around them. What about Anacostia or Potomac as our name? Something that means more to us than the term Columbia. Well, I don't know do any of the other commissioners no, want, I, then we can turn to the committee that I know had a discussion about this also. Yeah, I, I would like to answer that just by saying that New Columbia is a name that was voted on in 1982 by the Constitutional Convention. So it's already been picked by the people. Now, I, I wouldn't, I personally wouldn't object to putting other names out there. But I think until we have a vote of the people of the District of Columbia on what an appropriate name would be, uh, New Columbia has to has to take us there at this point. Any other comments on that question? Uh, it, it sounds like you heard what I said. I am personally not opposed to a discussion about the name. Um, and we can discuss, the commission can discuss how that to the public more generally, and it can it can be a part. I think there are a couple of we can have a couple of bites at that. Happen. Good, Madam Chair, can I ask John Valver to sure. speak to that? Yeah, and I would just say that the committee reviewed all of the records and documents from the '82 Constitutional Convention, and there was a robust debate about the name. Those of you who were there, I'm sure recall that. And the names that were considered were Anacostia, North Potomac. South Potomac, uh, Capital was one of the names that was discussed, and in the end, there was an overwhelming vote, of course, for, for New Columbia. So I just wanted to provide that historical perspective. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Uh, Maurice Jackson from the Georgetown University. <laughs> 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 uh, progressive history, and, uh, and uh, I'm also the chair. You've got to use your mic because uh, we can pick you up. Uh, first of all, and also chair of the D.C. Commission on African American Affairs, 82 uh, delegates. Uh, first, the document uh, does indirectly state that the 82 Commission was never voted upon. It was voted upon and ratified immensely by the D.C. Commission. Second, the, the, the question of process. It seems to me that if we want democracy, then we have to give democracy. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and now, while I understand lawyers, uh, 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 drafting something. The fact is, the lawyers don't draft the Constitution. Law, lawyers uh, advise the delegates who write the Constitution. And so I think the process is, there, is, 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 is a bit flawed. Now, the Washington Post doesn't often get things right. But yes, they actually did. A petition would be preceded by a November referendum, and if city voters favored statehood, they could mention the draft and ratify the Constitution. The new state would exclude such and such. So the process is not that a lawyer is write a constitution and then they give you two days to discuss it. And to say to me that everybody is becomes a delegate is to flaw democracy. Yeah. So I think yes. so I, I know we're in a hurry and I commend you, uh, Madam Mayor, the, the minister and my friend Franklin Nubbs, I commend you, but I think that if you take it this way, you would challenge to every legal uh, 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 process uh, possible because we are not taking it to the people. We are not doing it the way constitutions are done. And in our hurry to do something, we will be flawed. So I suggest that two days is not enough. Two days? It says here, two days of discussion on the Constitution. It says here in, in the timetable. No, 
No, we're releasing it today. It says two days of discussion. I'm just telling you what it says. So, so you can do okay. it online. Okay, all right. I, I think we got your comment. You got my, yep. my comment. Thank so, you. But I'm going to move on to the next person. So now. I question the process. Thank you. Thank you. Madam Mayor, when you uh, become governor, uh, what will be the process, or I haven't read the draft yet, for your taking over the District of Columbia National Guard? I'm just, I, I just have a, a military veteran question. Okay. Is that part of the that, that kind of thing? Ready. He wants to know. <laughs> okay. So first, I, I want, um, and I appreciate that comment, but I want everybody to know this is not about me. I'm the mayor, and quite frankly, a lot of people don't know this, but I have quite a lot of the powers that governors do, certainly more than any mayor that I've ever come across. So if it is, if it happens that I'm sitting in the seat when we become a state, so be it. But I want to make sure I'm working towards whoever is sitting in the seat will have the full power of a state. And so that's that's what we're focused on. Does anybody The D.C. National Guard is a federal entity by Congress, so Congress will have to change that to delegate them to become a state entity under the office of the government. Okay, got it. Many of those things would have to be addressed in the Admissions Act. In the Admissions Act. And so the National Guards is one of those things. Once we finish this process and we file the petition with the President, there will be an admissions act that will spell out a whole host of uh, powers that are not in the Constitution. Thank you, Ms. Perry. Yes, Ms. Jenkins. Yes, uh, I do want to... Mike, please. She needs a microphone, please. All right, thank you so much. I too want to commend uh, everyone for sticking to statehood. We know this is the only answer, the only way that we're going to get our full rights. We have to be a state. Um, I have two things I just want to say briefly. One is that the delegates that are here that uh, did the original initiative, uh, they know that it took them two years to go through the whole process. So I want people to really consider that it took a lot of time for this to, to happen to, and to come to fruition. And also, our organization, Stand Up For Democracy, uh, read the 82 and 87 Constitution at the Shaw Library. It's right there in the library. And we were <coughs> doing some comparisons. And the 82 Constitution, which was ratified, has a much longer list of the Bill of Rights than the 87. So I would like uh, whoever is dealing with that to compare the two and to make sure that we are not losing any of the rights that were in the 82 Constitution. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir, please uh, state your name. Howdy, my name is Fella Blair, and welcome to Ward 5 in the Lincoln Cottage, from which you can still see the capital of the United States of America. Um, my question is this. I wonder how the referendum is going to be uh, structured. Will it be possible for me or somebody else to vote in favor of statehood, yet in favor of the 82 Constitution rather than this new one? No. Will that be a possibility? No. And if not, how is it that you are telling me that I am playing the role of a member of the Constitutional Convention? Sorry, if I may. Um, the 1982 Constitution, it was ratified by the people, it was attached to a bill, it was filed in the Congress. As you perhaps know, each session of Congress, all of the measures that are not taken up, they expire. So, the 82, no, no, and unless, unless they are, it's attached to a bill. So I when the bill expires, the absence of a new Constitutional Convention, nothing has expired. So it was approved by a previous. If I may finish. So the government in 1987 took the position 
that that bill had expired and the council passed a new constitution which was not ratified by the people. And so, and so this process is just to update that 1987 constitution to make it contemporaneous with our government now. Okay, well, thank you. Along thank with you. many no, other no, people, you, I you, doubt that that's a factual Hello, yes. Hi, I'm Hector Rodriguez with Latinos for DC Statehood, and I want to congratulate and support this initiative that has been uh, set forth. Uh, when I got involved in this movement, my hair was black and now it's gray, but we're still fighting, okay? I want to congratulate the name because there's a reason that New Columbia fits, and that is New Columbia, born in Washington, D.C., New Columbia, born to be free. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'd like to add that Hector Rodriguez is here. Okay, there's a question here. Who has the question? from the, the members about a uh, discussion around the size of the legislature. Uh, Madam Chair, when we sat out on this process, we wanted to, um, our advisor, as I noted earlier, uh, Professor Viet Dean uh, is one that advised us on this effort. And what he advised us to do is to make sure that what our petition and our constitution are very compact and not with uh, wholesale changes. So we decided that we would keep our government at, in the same proportion, because you can imagine if we send a petition to Congress and we show a much expanded government, they may deem that to be a lack of responsibility. Uh, but I think that is an appropriate question, and I think we have 10 public engagement sessions. This commission is going to consider all of those. Um, the commission, has, we, we, we had that discussion with the commission. The commission told us to just keep the government at the same size, but I know this commission is willing to entertain that. Yep, any, any comments from members? Let me just say that uh, rights guaranteed by a constitution that never has the force of law are not rights, they're merely aspirational hopes. And the 1982 constitution spelled out many aspirational hopes, but it did not get a statehood. And without that formality and recognition by Congress, which constitutionally is still, require, is still required to approve the admission of any state, uh, no constitution will guarantee rights. It will merely continue to express our hopes. Uh, and while I like hope, I want to enjoy the same rights as every other American. While only some of my hair is as gray as Hector's, not all of it yet. Um, 
The other thing is that we're not necessarily writing this with an eye towards Congress. We know that there's a lot of things that Congress isn't going to uh, like about it. Congress imposed upon us a restriction that said who from what party can serve in our legislature. That's out of this document. But we are a colony and we want to stop being a colony. And we also want to make the transition from colonial rule to sovereign state rule as seamless and easy as possible for the institutions of our government. We want the new state to be able to function on day one uh, as quickly as we can. And so the main purpose of this Constitution is one big amendment. And that big amendment is not necessarily to enshrine forever the institutions of the home rule government that will have taken us there, but to get rid of the obstacles to our self-determination, the Congress of the United States of America. And once we do that, once we are a state, this document is as amendable and changeable as any state constitution will be. In fact, I think the amendment process is maybe even more liberal than a lot of other state constitutions. But until we get rid of Congress, uh, this is an academic discussion. And I, I don't want this to be an academic discussion. I want to debate uh, real issues as a citizen of a sovereign state. Right here. Two questions in the Hi, my name is Travis Swanson. I live in Randall Highlands in Ward 7, east of the river. And I would like to just uh, make known my strong objection to the name New Columbia. I know we've heard some mixed reviews out here in the audience. And uh, my concern is more so, you know, we for several years in the early history of this country have sugarcoated the history of Christopher Columbus mm -hmm. and what he did as a person. And uh, many cities and jurisdictions are starting to reject that notion now and have started calling Columbus Day Indigenous Peoples Day. And I don't think we should be, um, instill an honor on Christopher Columbus that would give him a star on our flag, in, on the US flag. I do think we should do a public referendum with some naming options for people to weigh in on this, for people to hear to, to get their say. A state name is, it's more than just a name, it's our identity. People in this country, we're New Yorkers, we're Californians, we're Wisconsinites, we're Floridians. And I think the people here really should get it to weigh in on their identity. Um, a couple suggestions I would have, um, just two, are one, I would like to see us name our state after a strong person of color who is uh, relevant in the history of our nation. Um, I think the state of Sojourner would be a great name, or Sojourner Truth. Or even better, or not better, equally as good, the uh, Commonwealth of Douglas, after Frederick Douglass, who actually resided in our city, unlike Christopher Columbus. Um, and with the, using the term Commonwealth there, the, the term DC would still remain somewhat relevant, so we could still use that. So I just wanted to voice my concern that the people really should be weighing in on this. You know, I think we made, I think we made it clear that, that we're willing to discuss all this, but I have to stand up for my Italian grandmother who would, who would tell you that maybe Columbus found the new world, maybe he didn't, but his greatest accomplishment was he talked a woman out of her jewelry so he could buy a boat. And that's not an easy thing to do. Okay, uh, let's, let's get one, another one in the back. Yeah, Jeff, okay, uh, thank you. I, um, I'm Linda Green and I live in Ward 2. I just want to say thank you to the mayor, to the chairman, to all the commission members. Uh, for putting this forward. I think this is a fabulous idea and it's really, it gives us something to really latch on to and work for. Um, and I don't denigrate taxation without representation, but it's more than a slogan. And it's really great, so thank you so much. Thank you, thank you. Question here, Professor? Yes, thank you. Mike. Uh, David Schwartzman from Ward 4, uh, Professor Emeritus Howard University, everyone is uh, referencing that, uh, and the D.C. State of Green Party. Now, at the previous uh, stated convention, I heard from Senator Strauss the rationale why we keep the present structure. In other words, 13 council people become legislators. And the rationale I heard was, well, it's working good now, it will work good in the future. Is it what's working good for whom? That's the question. With record, 
income inequality, the, one of the highest child poverty rates in the nation, is that working well? No. Or vanishing affordable housing for the majority of residents? So I challenge that and further, we are submitting something to satisfy Congress. So are we acting like the colonial subject begging to be admitted as a state or not? Are we demanding our rights, full rights? Thank you. And that, thank you. Thank so you. those are my comments. Thank you. Hi, my name is Bo Shelf. I live in Ward 6. Uh, I don't represent anybody at the moment. Uh, I want to address this subject, or some of the content, instead of the process, in that we have limited opportunity to address subject matter, and I thought this would be a good chance. The second article in the Bill of Rights is very concerning. I think uh, the right to bear and keep arms is a challenging notion within this city that we deal with on a constant basis. Uh, the language that's taken from the United States Bill of Rights is unclear. Uh, it is proven to be unclear in federal courts, state courts all over the country, and I would ask the legal group uh, and the overall commission to re-examine whether or not that exact language needs to be included as we're talking about uh, gun safety. Can you, can you talk about uh, the recommendation to put the Bill of Rights from 87 in this document? <coughs> starting point. We wanted to show a lot of respect for those who worked very hard on both the 82 and the 87 constitutions, but the gentleman's point is one that was raised in committee and we had some concerns about it, but we thought let's not start editing a Bill of Rights that's worked um, well for the federal government for a long time. Maybe this amendment hasn't, and, but we weren't going to start picking and choosing which amendments we liked and didn't, and so it the, that's what the process is for, and we're going to be taking down all the comments we hear today and considering and responding to each of them, and it may well be that that'll be one of the first changes that are made. And Lee, thanks. Well. Is this working? Yes. Good, yes. Uh, I'm Jay Lee Aiken, a ballot status candidate for at-large with the D.C. Statehood Green Party. I hope anybody who's Statehood Green will vote for me. Uh, I have been very concerned to see how the broader participation of the pe people has been cut down in this process. In 82, they were recommending 40 delegates, which is similar to what Vermont has. Uh, then in 87, it came down to 25 delegates, and now it's back down to 13. And one of the things I liked about having more delegates was, A, they won't be paid probably quite as much, so it doesn't become quite so much a lifetime job as, a, as a, something working for the people. And secondly, it's a little bit harder for the big developers and the, and the sports billionaires to grab hold of these people and persuade them to do what they want rather than what the people want. So I really think we need to look at that number. I think uh, 25 is a heck of a lot better than 13, and maybe 75,000 is a lot better than 130,000. Okay, I thank you for that. We've had a couple of comments about the size of the legislature, and I wanted to make sure we had an opportunity. Uh, do we have the list of the meetings? Oh, okay. I, make, I can read them into the record. I'm not sure. Are they in this book? Yes, yes. The, no, the, the large book. The letter size book that we passed out. Oh, okay. The back of it has a uh, list of all of the meetings. In this book? Okay. And, and this in 16. And I'm going to ask Professor Overton and uh, Lou Broderick to come up to assist us with answers as well. Okay. So we are we're, we have to wrap up the this portion of our program. I'm sure people will stick around for any questions. And I think you would have picked up, and if you didn't, it will be on the website, uh, a pamphlet that looks like this, which has all of the meeting dates. The next public forum, I believe, is going to be on Monday. Um, when this is a citywide ANCs have been called to have a similar discussion. Uh, and then there will be laid out meetings uh, across uh, the city in, in, in the wards in preparation for the Constitutional Convention. Uh, members, is there anything else you'd like to put on the record? Madam Chair, I would yes. just like to add that we are going to uh, 
supply all the libraries with copies. Okay. And we will also have all of the issues that have been raised that are before the commission online. So you can go online and see whether or not you know your issue is already before the commission to be addressed. Okay. So with that, it is now 314 and we're adjourned. <laughs> Park Service and Nora. Is that Nora? It's actually yeah. Nora, right? Anora uh, has been our host here at the Lincoln Cottage, and I believe that the visitor center is still open, Nora. Yes, free. Yes. Until 4.30. Free until 4.30. That's in um, an hour and 15 minutes, and the visitor center is just behind.